this is the OGM call on Thursday, June 15th, 2023. Hey, everybody. Um, going to turn, turn on the captions as well. There we go. I am in Waldport, Oregon, which is on the coast uh, below Cannon Beach, which is sort of the direct beach that if you were to drive west from Portland to go to the beach, you'd probably go to Cannon Beach. I'm south, well south of that, uh, but north of the dunes, uh, like the Dunes National Park and things like that are another, another hour south of us. It is chilly at the beach and it has been mostly kind of, uh, I've been here a couple of days, it's been mostly kind of foggy and gray and, and hard. And like, this is a, it's a treat to have, to see the horizon and mm. uh, be able to see what's going on here. And it's uh, cold enough that at some point I'll probably step inside uh, for my fallback position, so to speak. Um, how's everybody else? Good. Molto bene. Molto bene, cool. Um, Carl, are you still in your dad's place or? Excuse me? Are you at your dad's place? Uh, actually, it's now my place. Ah, I, okay. We went to settlement on the 30th, so I now own the family home. Congratulations. Thanks. Well, that's great. Um, we, um, so let me talk for a second about five minute universities just to sort of queue them up or spool them up for next call or the call after, depending if we want to do a check-in call next week. Um, but this is now kind of a, a common format. Uh, a bunch of years ago, I, I sort of created this format for uh, the retreats that I run. And it, it was a way of counterbalancing long, slow discussions or salon discussions and to drop in um, some peppy, fast uh, presentations about stuff. And also to tap into the wisdom of the group that showed up because we know stuff about stuff that nobody knows we know. And one of my favorite five minute universities from way back when was by JP Rangaswamy, uh, who told us all how to make the, the world's best Bolognese sauce. Because on a trip to Italy one year, he uh, I think was in Bologna, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember all the details of the story. I don't know, Pete, were you there at that, at that retreat? Doesn't ring a bell? Too bad. Um, any of you who were, raise your hand. But um, he, I think he, he might have been, in, let's pretend he was in Bologna and he went every, every lunch and dinner, he went to a restaurant and ordered spaghetti bolognese. Um, and then he narrowed down to the, his favorite one. And then he went and asked the chef, how do you make this? And I remember the recipe involved uh, milk, surprisingly, mm -hmm. and a couple other sorts of things. And it was just, he presented it so you know, wonderfully. And it was, these, these are all meant to be five minute capsules of something you know about, and it could be something really important. It could be something that, that can help us all manage life better. It could be something as simple as how to make tea. Um, so I was going to see uh, how many of us would like to share in. Uh, and, and the format is five minutes of presentation, five minutes of Q&A, bounce to the next person. And so if you want to continue the Q&A, just corner the person over lunch or break or you know whatever after, afterward is the idea. But it's, it's really fast moving and it covers a lot of different things. Uh, so we'll do a we'll do a uh, an OGM call in the five minute university format. I'll just create a page maybe where we can sign up for it or or something like that. It could be it could bold news. It could lead to world peace. I don't know. Um, and I was reflecting that Italy. I I may be really wrong about this, but Italy is the only country I can think of in the world where there is a cuisine, a familiar cuisine named after most of the major cities. Like we know what Florent, we know what Florentine means. We know what Parmigian means. We know what Romana means. Like those, those are all Italian cities, and they have char characteristic cuisines that we we all kind of know. Pickleball. Um, have you seen paddle? P a d e l. Mike, you're aware of, of paddle? I am. I have not 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 as I, I haven't played it. Just seen it. So so paddle is sort of kind of pickleball meets racquetball because it's played in a court with walls and uh, you can bounce and you can bounce off the walls uh, which adds dimensionality to it and a fer ferocity of play uh I'll, I'll put a link in the chat for um some really good like paddle finals but uh, ferocity does not lead to world peace <laughs> good, good point pickleball good. is a sport that almost anybody can pick up in about half an hour and it 
it is impossible to smash the ball. It's designed to be slow and precise. It's about finesse and placement and teamwork. Teamwork. Now, now you're going to have a lot of trouble making peace with the tennis players. Well, dying breed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there we go. So we don't have to worry about them so much. That's good. Um, hi, Kate. Thanks, hi. For, thanks for joining us. Thank you. My aunt. My aunt is presenting, but she installed something that's getting in the way of her joining. Is there a, a, a meeting, um, the meeting passcode, URL? ID and passcode? Uh, so, oops. So if you give her this link, it should include the passcode. So that should get um, that should get her in here. Great, great. I don't know what she installed. Oh, good. Thanks. Let's see. All right. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. I think it's changed the passcode to pickleball. <laughs> In the interest of world peace? Yes, exactly. Oh, man. Um, so um, while that is happening, um, so um, any questions about Five Minute University? Anybody have a, a I, I did a Five Minute University once at, at one of these events about uh, tea, just what I know about teas and the, diff every, the difference between black tea, green tea, white tea, uh, infusions versus teas, how to brew tea, a couple of really simple things. It was like quick and fun. Um, curious uh, questions, thoughts, topics you'd like to talk about. And I, I'm, I, I, I was talking with Pete. I tried to find a timer for Zoom so that I could set a timer up so that everybody can see the, 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 the clock tick down. And I found a mediocre timer that only puts a timer in my window so that when somebody's speaking, you wouldn't really be able to see the timer, et cetera. If anybody has a better timer solution for Zoom, LMK, because uh, it's not, uh, wasn't, wasn't working right for me. Anyway, no questions? Cool. Let's um, shift over to the topic then, which um, kind of needs Mark Carranza to be in the room for. Although we're recording and uh, we could then do it later, but I'm tempted to not go into indigenous wisdom and ways of knowing because we won't have Mark's energy uh, and spirit in the room while starting that conversation. So, um, oh, it would have been so cool if Mark had joined right at that moment as I was <laughs> saying that. Uh, Kate, you're muted. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, my aunt who's presenting says he's not coming, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna text him. He's already said good morning to me, so maybe I can get him on here. Excellent. Sorry, and you're talking about Mark? Yeah, Mark Carranza. I did not know you were connected to him, so my apologies. Yes. I, I didn't understand that that's where you were you all were coming from. I am very happy. And oh, so we you. will kill some time and tell some jokes until he shows up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Janet, hi. Hi. I'm glad you made it into the into the Zoom. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to it. I enjoyed it last time. Yay. This will be my second time. Excellent. Um, so anyone have a burning topic? Anyone want to talk about uh, the Vision Pro headset or um, fires in Canada somehow darkening the skies of America or Pete? Anything but the Trump indictment. Or that thing. Uh, I have a short topic, but it's it's rude to bring it up. Um, so I'll bring it up anyway, but okay, and, and apologize for being rude, I guess. Um, I uh, Blue Sky is uh, yet another microblogging platform that kind of got started by uh, Jack at, at Twitter um, and then it might have ended up being a haven for um, Twitter refugees uh, instead of Mastodon, except it wasn't quite ready. Um, it's still in limited limited release, uh, invite only. I, I had been resisting the temptation to uh, accept an invite from one of my friends uh, because it's like, who needs more microblogging? Um, once Musk kind of killed Twitter for me, it's like, whatever. I'm on Mastodon, I'm on Noster, um, they're great. Um, you know, I, I miss my old Twitter um, that had um, the news of the world. Um, by the way, there's a great, I'll put it, uh, I'll put it in chat later. There's a great uh, blog post by, um, uh, and kind of an OGM person from Fellowship, the link, um, Aram, uh, actually explains 
pretty well why Twitter was as awesome as it was. He, he said it wasn't a mic, it was an amp. Um, uh, anyway, I finally accepted a, you know, the, the invite from one of my friends. Yes, please, I, 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 I have too much work to do this week, so I need to, uh, something to procrastinate yet again, um, and uh, got on Blue Sky. Um, Blue Sky ends up being very nice. I like it. Um, uh, the, it, it looks almost exactly like Twitter. Um, it's very young and new. Um, it's in the honeymoon phase. Everybody's cute and talking about, you know, how, how much they enjoy not being on Twitter, basically, without mentioning Twitter. Um, uh, there's not a lot of there there. There's uh, not enough people yet, I think. Um, uh, but some of the architectural stuff, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Some of the architectural stuff is actually really well done. Um, and as an example, it's easy to swap in uh, something based on your domain name instead of a handle. And it's going to work everywhere on Blue Sky, any, any distributed server, decentralized server, not just uh, Mastodon doesn't really work that way, which is frustrating. Um, another, another thing is uh, it's got an algorithmic feed, um, except it's not one algorithm, it's whatever algorithm you want. So there's a marketplace of algorithms for algorithmic feeds, um, and they're kind of plug and play. A few of them are, are written by the Blue Sky devs, and a bunch of them aren't. Um, and they are weird things like um, uh, uh, all news articles or um, uh, all gay or all, you know all the all the people who want to be in the gay part of um, blue sky or um, uh, some more complicated things like uh, posts mostly from your friends and friends uh, of people you follow and people they follow um, and more biased towards the interesting posts of them. Um, so people are playing around with the algorithms and coming up with some good ones and different than you know the official one. So the whole modularity of the thing actually actually works, um, and I'm very pleasantly surprised to see that. So it's super frustrating that they don't have enough invites. Um, I guess it's maybe kind of a good thing to grow it slowly, um, but um, it's it's something to look forward to, I think. And I'll let y'all know when I have invites, which I don't expect for a while. So which part of that was was rude or or out of step? I you know it's like thanks Pete uh, thanks for virtue signaling that you got into this you know in group and and we can't because the, you don't have any invite codes you probably have a whole bunch and you're not sharing them. I it's rude I think, <laughs> but uh, y'all know me and you know it, it's a it's a report from some part of the world that you'll get to at some point. Um, and I guess the reason I bring it up maybe is partly, partly because I was like struck, like surprised. Oh my God, somebody can actually kind of like design a system uh, that might actually not suck. Uh, we could have a longer discussion, maybe a five minute un university why Mastodon is great and why it really, really, really sucks. Um, uh, but that sounds cool. I, and and I, I had gotten to the point with Mastodon. Mastodon is kind of like almost good enough, you know? It's like okay, I guess I guess we can limp along with this thing. Um, it's it's got a lot of structural problems um, sociologically and um, uh, and and partly technically, but mostly sociologically. And and I was like, okay, well, I guess we're stuck with you know you know something that's uh, twice as good as Twitter on its best days and like like a hundredth as good as Twitter on its worst days. Um, Blue Sky seems to be much more in the middle of that. You know, it's yeah. like, ah, oh, kind of. This will be maybe the good parts of Twitter without, you know, with, with. I, I wouldn't say without the bad parts. It's going to have bad parts of Twitter, but it'll be also tunable so that you can just grab kind of the, the chunk that you want instead of, you know, having to take the whole thing. Is there a desktop app? Part of my problem with Blue Sky is that it's only on my phone, and I just don't pick up and use my phone that way. Uh, right? it's got a a fine web, um, web uh, version. Oh, good. I will need to find that. We have comments from Doug and Mike, and then we'll switch because Mark has joined us. We will switch to the topic at hand. Well, I was just going to come up with another topic, but that's now passe because Mark is here. I am afraid that is true. Why am I here? Pardon? I'm, I'm, oh. I, I got a phone call saying that I need to be here, and I was going to basically eat breakfast, but um, uh, okay, I'm here. Mark. My apologies, Mark. I sent out the OGM invite saying that we were going to pick up the topic that you had uh, talked about, oh. about indigenous wisdom. 
Oh. And so I, I thought you were here knowing that that was the case. Um, um, sorry, been busy this week, medical stuff, but um, okay, I'll, I'll stay here. Cool. And so now I don't understand what Janet is presenting, but I'd love to know. Uh, but before we do that, let's empty the queue and see what Mike was about to say, maybe about Blue Sky. No, not about Blue Sky. I, I was going to be a little bit rude, too, and just ask a, a selfish question. I'm doing a lot of work on digital public infrastructure. Some people use the phrase digital public goods. If anybody knows anybody they respect on that topic or uh, have thought about, written about, uh, spoken about, let me know. Uh, say more about public, public good. Digital public good is uh, a phrase that uh, Omidyar has been using. Um, the United States State Department, particularly its development agencies, are using that as an umbrella term for things that governments are doing to stimulate the growth of open uh, infrastructure, not just for e-government, but for other purposes. And the, the classic example is uh, what Estonia did for its own citizens for e-government. But the more important one by far is what India is doing with the India stack. And the three layers are Adhar, which is the digital identity layer, UPI, which is the universal public infrastructure layer, and then a layer for data sharing and data protection. Um, the long term is DEPA, data empowerment and protection architecture. Um, that's the least worked out. It hasn't really you know, been implemented very widely, and there's a lot of uh, unanswered questions about it. But the whole idea is to do more projects like the internet was in 1985 when government got in there and built this network for one community and then everybody else could build on top of it. But that's and, and, and if I may, that was beautiful and wonderful and, and the answer I didn't know I needed. Thank you. Um, could you say a little bit more since you're sitting, since you sit in Washington sometimes about public good, uh, public good versus, you know, like the commons or like private good or? Yeah, well, the, the phrase digital public good is being used for 101 different things. And it's most people working in the policy area have kind of shied away from that just because every time you use that phrase, somebody thinks of something else. And because when you say public good, it automatically prejudges the situation and says, okay, this will only be provided by government because it's a public good and otherwise not provided for. The debate over digital public infrastructure is how does government do just enough? You know, how do you stimulate a whole lot of investment from universities, from governments, from individuals, and, uh, and, and yet get it all working together? So that again, like the internet, the government came in, built this network. It had some anchor tenants, <clears throat> a whole bunch of universities and federal labs. And then everybody said, whoa, look at this. <clears throat> and everybody connected. So that's that's what uh, the theory behind digital public infrastructure is. And the reason they say um, public infrastructure rather than public good is because then you focus on the foundation, not there on the apps. Down. And you you acknowledge that infrastructure is not just built by public institutions, maybe funded. Um, I, I, but anyway, sorry. that's I, I, I'm, I'm walking into I, I also want to apologize. I have to leave in about 25 minutes. But anybody who cares about DPI or uh, wants to learn more, you can also go to the Carnegie website and type in digital public infrastructure and you'll see some interesting pieces on what India is doing. Have you talked to Ethan Zuckerman? Uh, uh, yes, of course. Okay. He's the topmost source that I can find on the subject right away. Right. Uh, cool. Um, anybody who has leads or comments, uh, put them in the chat for a while, send Mike an email, whatever else. Uh, Mark, do you have your hand up on this topic? Excellent. Please jump in. Yeah. So, um, gosh, around 2010 to 2009, um, I was... Uh, uh, brought to um, Chinatown, D.C. to um, basically help out with um, Microsoft's Data Mart. Um, and, you know, basically they 
we're hoping to, you know, provide um, free data resources, mainly from the UN, um, but also, you know, NBA stats, NFL stats for 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 sale, and you know, being an employee of the you know Internet Archive, I'm also kind of wondering about okay, you know, how other you know groups like the EFF, like you know IPFS, um, a, are are basically fitting into this this notion, and and it's a mm. notion I haven't really paid attention to, but as part of the quantified self group, you know, everybody was talking about <coughs> how can we basically take our, you know, homemade, you know, CPAP, uh, you know, data or diabetes data and share it, you know, for the public good, because we're all taking data in these completely different um, formats. How do we basically, yeah, create a data commons where we can kind of you know, predictively get that. And, you know, when I talk to scientists and people who, you know, contribute to, you know, the data um, of science, it's it's always kind of like, yeah, data quality is, it's just too tough to basically take our data and reformat it so somebody else can use the data because there's so many tweaks of data quality along the way. Anyway, um, just... It's a it's an interesting thing. I'll I'll certainly take a look at it, but um, it, it just seems like there's so much where the audience is so broad for any particular tiny little slice of data to really kind of be spread across a public good. Um, well, that's why you start with subsets, right? You know, and it may be that the oceanograph the oceanographic data sets uh, are used to pull the oceanographic community together and to make sure you have good quality data, you have provenance, uh, and you can see who's using it. I mean, that's part of it is you want to build in, uh, I call it mutually assured disclosure. You know, I'll, I'll do the effort, I'll put my data up there, and I'll try to explain where it comes from. If you tell me when you use it, and I can see that it's valuable, and I can understand, I get feedback on how to make it more valuable. So that that's the mutually assured disclosure part of it that uh, has been missing. There, 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 there's, you know, either either all the data gets sucked into a giant data ocean owned by Amazon or one of the data brokers, and they use it for whoever knows what, or I sit on the data myself and maybe give it to some friends who ask me politely. Uh, and the whole idea of DEPA is to empower data users and empower the people whose data is contributed to this architecture. But again, I, I since since people are just getting up to speed on this, we don't want to talk about it now, but I will put a very good reference. I already put one reference out there. We had a the leader of the whole effort in the Indian government came to Washington and gave a wonderful uh, hour long discussion about this. It was a fireside chat. And I, I'm adding another one that just came out last week or last month from um, my colleagues in India on sort of high level, you know, what makes this useful and what kind of principles do you want to embody in the architecture to make it work? But again, I'm, I, 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 I really had a one sentence question. <laughs> which was, hey, has anybody heard about this and and it, who's interested? So thank you. This is great. Mike, thank you very much. This is why I love this group. Thank you. Um, love that. Uh, Janet, I'm. this may be a brain fart on my part, but I think you came uh, ready to present something, but I am not sure what you are ready to present. Would you? Um, <clears throat> would you? Well, okay. Me... So let me explain just a little bit. So, okay, this is my second meeting. So... <clears throat> I uh, was under the impression that we were going to have quite a number of these uh, five-minute universities, oh, uh, I, which was, oh. um, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to stick my baby out there if nobody else is, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I practiced it a couple of times last night. I couldn't get it down to five minutes. Um, but um, I mean, I don't know. Um, so tell uh, you, it'd probably be prudent to hang out with the group for. Oh, a few months before I really, uh, you know, start contributing. I don't know, but uh, um, I don't know. I can, and uh, uh, it could be amusing. We'll see. 
so I sent a note last night to the OGM Google group, which you may not be on, saying, gosh, I, I didn't do a good job of stewarding the uh, five-minute university session, postponing it, and saying, gosh, let's do that on a, in a future call. And instead, let's turn our attention to indigenous ways of knowing, which uh -huh. is a question Mark had brought up, but Mark was unaware that that was the, the, the shift <laughs> that made. So we have an interesting situation here where we could kind of play with what we've got. I would be very excited to hear your talk and then you would effectively be launching five minute universities in open global mind, which is pretty cool as far as I can tell. But I totally understand that you may not want to like jump out that far or whatever else. And in in sort of to balance all that out, we would not worry about the five minute timer and you could <laughs> run over for a while and we would all like be totally groovy with that. Uh huh. Okay. Because you're the test pilot. Okay, well, you know, so this is a presentation, uh, so I guess, um, I guess I don't mind doing it, um, and it's a presentation that, um, uh, or at least a kind of a pared down present uh, version of it uh, that I did for a conference in uh, Santa Barbara at a um, permaculture conference, um, and uh, the people that were in charge of it uh, became interested in it after finding my book. And um, so I wrote a book called uh, Recycle Everything, Why We Must, How We Can. And it's a pretty short, you know, like an hour read, let's say, or something. Um, but I think that it embodies the ideas that would be needed to actually recycle everything. And um, it's, um, gee, maybe almost two decades old now. Um, but I think it still holds water. And um so I can, uh, uh, without taking too much time, so we can get around to the indigenous portion. Um, uh, I'll, if you want me to, I'll get started. I would love that. Everybody else good with okay. that? And and since it's a five minute university and five minutes of Q and A, we'll be through in ten minutes, and then we can we can shift. I, I'm there. We go. I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, let's give it a try. Okay. Hopefully, you can see this. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So here we go. Uh, recycle everything. Uh, let me see. Your presentation mode. Yeah. Can perfect. we really recycle everything? Yes, we can. Here's how. Uh, recycling everything. Let's see. I got to move some of this stuff here. Um, so in this presentation, we're going to see what's needed to make it happen. Uh, we're going to dump uh, current assumptions that prevent change take a trip into the world of industry and science and explore breakthrough ideas. I'm Janet Unruh. I live in Portland, Oregon, and um, I've been an instructional designer for 30 plus years, manufacturing industry for 10 of those years. I have a master's of engineering and technology management from Portland State University, and I wrote this book. And so my journey was that I began looking for truly sustainable systems didn't find any, uh, decided to design some, and finally wrote the book. So what is the problem we're trying to address? Well, um, the earth is finite. Uh, we're using up its resources uh, rather rapidly. Um, landfills and waste are burgeoning. And so let's just have a look at the uh, current linear <clears throat> production consumption system. <clears throat> Okay, I'm sure you all know this. Let's just have a little quick look. So there's the raw materials, extractors, the primary processors, parts suppliers, producers, or otherwise known as manufacturers, uh, uh, distributors, retail outlets, consumers. And finally, uh, at the end of the line is the landfill. In some cases, there are um, uh, certain products that get remanufactured and uh, where I worked, there was some, uh, but ultimately, in pretty much all these cases, um, things just wind up going into the landfill ultimately. And so the pressures on industry, uh, the cost and the supply of raw materials, um, you know, is are two of the risks in the SWOT uh, calculation. And so raw material prices and uh, supply problems. Um, you know, at least are perceived to be uh, increasing, which will just take that top one, the uh, aluminum. Uh, it's perceived in these uh, survey respondents that the price increase uh, will be a, a threat as well as supply problems. And um, so the question is, can materials keep on flowing? 
and there are impacts on supply, such as price fluctuations, speculation, decreasing quality, lower grades, and so on. And uh, the one at the bottom, the dependency on oil and petrochemicals for transportation, for processing, for energy, uh, these are all uh, pressures on industry. So how much do we have left of the world's resources? Well, okay, some time back, uh, there was an audit. I haven't found a more recent one, but this one uh, was done by Armin Reller and uh, Dr. Thomas Gradle at Yale. And uh, their uh, representation looks like this, which is maybe a little difficult to read. Uh, but these are some of the representative uh, uh, at the time that they calculated the number of years to exhaustion uh, for various um, types of uh, raw materials. And so recycling is an urgent matter. And currently the burden of recycling falls on consumers, local governments and concerned nonprofits, all of whom are at the end of the process. And so what do we mean by recycling? Um, there's a lot of different terms for for recycling, and I just want to clarify what I mean by recycling. And so let's take upcycling. Upcycling is when um, uh, waste products are <clears throat> used to make new consumer products, um, such as uh, perhaps if you like a picture frame made out of M&M wrappers or things like that. Um, downcycling is the use of waste products to make hmm, like fillers or fuel. And, uh, but then again, after the second use, they are discarded. Uh, there's free cycling, there's blended recycling. And, you know, by that mainly, uh, you know, if you have such things as uh, recycled aluminum cans, um, they have to be, their quality has to be bolstered uh, with additional raw materials. And so what is, what do we mean by real recycling? So none of those are real recycling. So real recycling, means reusing materials to make the same products again and again. Um, and this is the kind of recycling I want to look at in this presentation. So what are we to take to recycle everything? So first of all, let's look at sustainable systems. Once a thing, here's what I believe. Once a thing can be imagined, it can be engineered. Uh, so reforming the system, let's look at it. So Current efforts to reform the production consumption system focus on reducing the flow of materials through the system by either slowing it down or decreasing the amount. And so what about redesigning the system? Here it is again. So what we would do to it is we would eliminate the beginning and the end stages and modify some of the roles and add a couple of other roles. And now we're gonna uh, put it into the circle. So that's what we mean by sustainability. It has to flow in a circle. And so here's a little explanation of how it's gonna work. So the materials processor no longer processes raw materials, but also re, or I should say, ideally, reprocesses recyclable materials. The new parts are made of reprocessed materials and the producer uses the new parts and parts from used products. Distributors take on the additional role of the collector uh, they lease products to the consumer and test products and lease them to secondary markets. Uh, consumers lease the products and return them. And the disassembler, this is an interesting one, I think, they disassemble used products and send as-is reusable parts to the producer and the used parts broker. Um, they send parts that can't be reused to the materials processor. The used parts broker sells used parts to new parts uh, suppliers and producers and sells the non-usable parts to the materials processor. So that completes the circle. Um, so that would in, in turn uh, entail extraction phasing out, landfills to stop growing, uh, consumers lease products, uh, producers manage their materials and track them throughout the cycle and there could be new jobs and the system could become sustainable. And so one little distinction I just wanna make is in the case of, I, I call it organic, but what I mean, like take these chairs, for example, um, one would not paint them with um, paint or um, you know, other types of varnishes or whatnot because that causes them not to be uh, composted. So things that are compostable should be uh, treated as such and not um, spoiled, if you like, with, uh, with different coatings or treatments. 
So what would it take to recycle everything? Part two, uh, recycle material, recyclable materials. Here's where it gets fun too. So um, recyclable materials are critical to recycling everything. And we have to back up all the way to the molecules. So there's been a lot of work uh, done in it so far. Um, of course, it hasn't been applied quite yet. Um, so requirements are key. So there's requirements already, of course. So if you need to have a hard plastic uh, to serve as a housing for laptops, et cetera. You know, you have your requirements. It has to be durable, washable. Um, okay, maybe not black, but um, it has to be, let's target 100% recyclable. So how can it work? So the product design would need to work very closely with material engineering. And material engineering would then work with a, would write a reprocessing plan, namely the requirements for it. And then that would in turn be implemented by facilities and equipment. And so some examples of reprocessing can be, and this is something that has to be uh, coordinated and not just done like an afterthought, it has to be done as part of the development process as to what type of reprocessing you're going to use uh, that's appropriate. But using heat or cold, electromagnetism, shredding, uh, microwaves, et cetera, fusion torch. I just have been reading about that recently, programmable matter. Um, and let's take, for example, here's one about shredding. So this company, uh, Result Technology, they reprocess all this type of circuit boards and electric stuff. They basically put it into a centrifugal force and shred it. And the uh, output uh, is these various uh, um, compounds here. And of course, there's probably quite a bit of waste as well. All right, let's look at the design for disassembly. This is the third main part of the system. So here again, we've got material engineering and product design. And now the product design has to work very closely with uh, facilities and equipment to design a disassembly plan. So you have the assembly plan, and uh, then you also have to have the disassembly plan. And so you have to write those requirements and then those requirements get sent over to facilities and equipment so that it can be implemented. Oops, uh, the disassembly process uh, has to be automated. Uh, all the joins between parts have to be reversible. The parts have to be recoverable. Uh, the materials have to be separable. And of course, the disassembly and reuse must be cost-effective. Now here's an example uh, that was done in the university, the Technical University in Berlin, where they set up a demonstration disassembly plant for such things as refrigerators. As, I don't know if you can see them in there. Whoops. Uh, there's, a, I believe that's a washing machine. And um, so they actually took finished products and uh, afterwards um, uh, set up this disassembly process. Okay, and last of all, and this is the kind of we're getting to the end, uh, resources are finite and must be managed. This is part of a new mindset that we need to have. Uh, everyone has to adapt to a closed system for handling materials. Uh, consumers would lease products and producers would need to manage materials and track them through the system. Oop. Okay, so we got it all. And so if you want more detail, um, I've got my book, uh, got it right here. Um, and basically it talks more about the projections of raw material shortages, our strategic supply in this country, and more detail and diagrams. And that's it. How'd I do? Yeah. Did I get it in eight minutes this time? Uh, no, it was 12. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. Um, 11 uh, or 12, somewhere in there. I didn't, I wasn't timing okay. perfectly, but you, you went over by a little bit, but it was great. I really loved it. And we're oh, going to switch immediately you. to five minutes of Q&A. So at 8.45, we will switch topics again. Uh, Doug has a question for you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is quite admirable, but I think there's a real problem. And that okay. is re recycling is very energy intense. And that energy is going to be produced under the current conditions by oil and coal. Right. Uh, so it seems to me that puts us in a really difficult situation. Um, you know, what's interesting is I, I just uh, was reading this uh, curious book that I just got. And um, it's, um, this is actually a paper that was written in 1969. And um, they have solved the problem 
through the use of uh, a fusion, what they call a fusion torch. And um, of course they want to use nuclear energy in different forms. And so, you know, realizing that uh, energy is gonna be a problem uh, for just about everything, not only recycling, um, that would be their solution would be to use, and they wanna use uh, um, uh, fission uh, instead of uh, uh, fusion, instead of fission. Uh, nuclear energy to accomplish all this. So yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's pie in the sky, but I don't know. I think we're going to have to do something. Would that address uh, your 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 question, uh, Doug? Well, uh, I mean, you, using fusion energy to do the recycling leaves out the fact that the energy that's produced by nuclear power has to be distributed somewhere into factories that are doing the recycling. And those factories are, and those process is going to be run by energy. Uh, okay, so it's coming from the nuclear power plant. But first of all, that's a long ways in the future time-wise. And second, it's an, also an energy intense process because the nuclear plant has to be hooked up to something. So there's a lot of infrastructure costs. We, are, we have very little time for Q&A. So Doug, I'm going to interrupt you and go to the next person. Um, thank, thank you for that. Uh, please get in touch with Janet if you want to keep going. Uh, Janet, could you unshare your presentation so we can sure. see everyone everyone better during the Q&A? And let's go to Gil and Klaus. Yeah, Janet, thank you for uh, the densely packed story. Um, <laughs> um, along lines with Doug is saying, I'm much more, I'm much more interested in the upstream solutions. Uh, in what companies do, how products are designed, how they're manufactured, uh, are they designed for durability or short life? Uh, product take back systems, uh, extended producer responsibility policy that says that the person who the entity that produces the problem has to pay for it, not the consumer has to deal with the recycling. And we see a primitive version of that in, in the bottle bill, bottle deposit legislations. Uh, but we, we did a project for one client, a manu very large manufacturing company, where we found that a product take back system had the potential of doubling their global revenue. So like huge financial incentives rather than the end of life, you know, kind of put a bandaid on it strategies that most recycling has been for so long. So I would love to see more of that in, in a future presentation. I think that would really enrich what you're, what you're doing here. M lots to say about all this stuff, but time is short. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Um, Ken. Oh, sorry, uh, Klaus. Yeah, along the same lines of cost, um, the, the, there is upfront cost involved in the design um, and in uh, potentially the reconfiguration of sourcing uh, raw materials. Um, so companies have strenuously avoided uh, uh, adding cost. So Gil just mentioned the bottle bill, for example, that thing in California is ridiculous. I mean, there's no pickup, you don't get your money back. You know, I've, I've uh, here, here in in Oregon, it's pretty well regulated. They have separate uh, recycle posts in California. That's just not the case. So that's just one example. So the, there is a cost involved, and and in order to build a platform, you know, a a, uh, a playing field here that's that's uh, that levels uh, uh, the the. Uh, the game for everyone, you would need regulations. You would need to have a regulatory floor that compels companies to do this so everybody has the same cost foundation. So how do you see that happening? You know, how do you see the, the uh, companies uh, deal with the cost implications of, uh, uh, of uh, using a circular economy? Well, I actually think that... Um the pressures that uh, come about when um, uh, certain raw materials are increasingly costly to extract, when, when that cost becomes greater than the cost to recover, that that's when you're gonna see the change. So we're not there yet. Um, you know, and that's when I think the interest is gonna start to be generated. So it's, it's always like, you know, when the cost, when the pain is worse, you know, to do what you to keep on doing what you're doing rather than to change course. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not, so, I don't even know if um, regulation would help, uh, although I'm sure it would, but um, 
it's it could be just eventually you know to be ready with a solution when uh you know the the um, extraction becomes too costly it's not no longer cost effective compared to the new solution does that work does that make sense klaus yeah i mean it's unfortunate right because we don't really have a great deal of time so there needs to at least be an on-ramp towards these conversions. And I don't see that really. I mean, the attempts that have been made to create an on-ramp, like a bottle bill, for example, have been very fragile, you know, because the industry continues to, to uh, negate any kind, any attempt by the government to regulate uh, these, these uh, issues. And you now, I mean, we're just running out of time. So I, do, I just, no, don't think this will be fast enough, which is why I like this article where artificial intelligence may help us, right? Because maybe we can program intelligence into the process to where it just uh, where it just flows without adding a lot of cost. We have gone over our five minutes by two minutes now, but we did go over on the at the beginning, but we're eating time from the other topics. So, uh, Pete, I don't think you, the question you're about to ask is brief. Can you ask it very <laughs> briefly? And Kate was in the queue, uh, it's, same thing. It's very brief and and not even a question. Uh, okay. Janet, uh, I just wanted to say for, I, I think maybe it's obvious, but uh, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, the the engagement you see is is maybe a little bit skeptical, but it it is a uh, it is it is an expression of our love for your your uh, presentation. Not, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. You did well, a great job. It needs Thank to you. be kind of punched around a bit so it can be improved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do that. Thanks. <laughs> um, thank you. I didn't think you were going there. Um, Kate, did you want to say what you were going to say a moment ago? And then we'll switch topics. Yeah, I just think there will be a lot more pressure in the future. This book will be a lot more popular. In, in 200 years, we won't have a choice but to come back to this book. But right, right yeah. <laughs> which is right which now, is unfortunately how motivated. which is What's unfortunately how, how it's unfortunately how history works a lot it's like we don't actually move until the stresses are so large that we can't avoid moving and then we look back and we're like oh gosh so many people were telling us we had to do this yeah so uh, maybe we can all conspire to figure out how to move things faster toward that um janet thank you so much that was that was really lovely, and you were brave and wonderful to jump in as the lead five minute university. Uh, I think you have demonstrated that the challenge of of nailing five minutes is quite a challenge. It is, and we will see how we go moving forward. Okay. I was at I was at the I was at um, on on the Stanford campus years ago. B. J. Fogg, who teaches uh, uh, captology, basically how to get people to do stuff, ran a course where he had his students present in two and a half minutes. They had each team had two and a half minutes to present their results. And the way he the way he figured it all out was uh, he had a student with a glockenspiel at the front of the room. And at the two and a half minute mark, that student had to start hitting the glockenspiel. When the audience heard the glockenspiel, we had instructions to applaud loudly. And you can't talk over loud applause. And it worked. It was like all and all the students were like on it and, and really nailing it. So I don't know that we'll do that here, but but thank you for that. And with that, I'm going to switch to Mark with my apologies that we have taken up so much of the time of this call. We could move the topic also if, if we find that we're like in a, in a good warm place uh, at the end of our time, we can also always pick up the topic uh, separately. But I was going to ask you, Mark, just to restate your uh, the, the position you, you stated earlier, your discomfort uh, as just the, the starting uh, provocation for this conversation. Um, sure. Um, I'll start um, with the notion of history. Um, basically, we all start as two cells that join together. All, all, all animals start as a microscopic bit, and then we grow to, you know, this size and this wide and, and this deep or crazy. And there are you know the humanity oh, what is that notion from uh, big history we have um stored knowledge and transmitted knowledge through the ages and people who come before us um our ancestors are responsible for great extinctions um for 
you know, warming the planet for um, mass human cannibalism and death. And, you know, my heritage being from uh, Toltec or Aztec or, or Mayan, um, I had this marvelous reveal when I read something called the four agreements and, you know, Toltec wisdom from the ancients. And it's like, wait a second, Toltec wisdom was killing, you know, 4,000 slaves on a weekend. What is this Toltec wisdom? Um, repackaged as um, the four agreements um, and, and, you know, multiple things from a bruja, a brujo, a, a, a witch, a, a wise man from, from the Toltecs. Um, I actually have been reading um, a number of indigenous um, books suggested by a cousin of mine. And, you know, scale is interesting when we basically have something like the internet. What is the indigenous wisdom of the internet? I mean, these things take time to figure out. Um, that's about it. You know, I mistrust you know, the Plains Indians who um, may have, you know, had a sustainable history of being very integrated with their environment when that's applied to the city of Chicago. Thanks. Um, Mark, I think that's perfect. That's a really nice sort of uh, rolling off point for where we are. And I appreciate your sharing that with us. And I'm going to pass the con to Kevin for to start us off down this road. Yeah, I've been um, working with some indigenous folks about coming to our neighborhood economics and um, kind of entering the marketplace that is there for economic justice. Um, but they have a condition um, that they don't like exits. They don't see if, if it's working, why would you stop? And so there's a deal that uh, a friend negotiated uh, with the uh, Eastern Band Cherokee, which are the ones here that you know hid up in the hills while everybody was sent to to Oklahoma. So they're somewhat less trusting than a lot of tribes because they are the ones who hid up in the hills from the genocide. Uh, so anyway, um, and uh, the town of Franklin, and they agreed on a historical heritage tourist attraction, local attraction, that would uh, tell the story of the tribe in that place and the story of the white people in that place. And to, so to get there, in the principle of no exits, they had to agree on a common future. And from what I'm told, that, that hasn't been done in the previous 400 years where a tribe and a white, you know, in this case, a municipality, agreed on a common future and a view of the past. I mean, you know, you, you also have to talk about, you know, the recent unpleasantness of the Trail of Tears, you know, that, that, that whole kind of thing. And, and so it's a story of the future, but it really they had to agree on a, on, on a common future in order to make it work. And uh, there's a whole lot of understanding on both sides where, where you have to do that. It, it, was, it was pretty cool. Kevin, can you say a tiny bit more about no exits? What does that mean? Well, that, that means it's like you, when you do a business, you know, you do exits, like you, you prep it for sale, right? I mean, you, 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 you make money from a business by selling it, you know, either to the public or to somebody else, you know? And so, because you can extract, if you build a good business, you can extract a lot more time of sale. Uh, you know, you can just, you make money when you sell it and then, then you have the money, you know? And, but they don't like deals that that where either side would exit. So you have to you know imagine the future together, linked. So that's the only way you can do it. You know, sharing the land together. You know, we are all relations. Um, it puzzles me often that capitalism hates stability. It's very strange. But I I, I had an insight recently that that speculators love beta volatility. They hate predictability. Uh, way back in the day, IBM had really good CFO and they had, the, they had really stable earnings. They were managing everything to have like total predictability. The stock market despised that. 
and and like did not did not value or reward that at all. Stock market loves tipping things. And with that, I want to route us back toward indigenous historic violences and other sorts of things that trouble Mark because we could easily get into a conversation about the evils of capitalism, but that's sort of not the topic at hand. What what can we can we head back in uh, toward Mark's provocation, please? Anyone who'd like to step in. Please, Ken. I would like to step in. So um, I'm going to quote in the chat from Tyson Yonka Portis' Sand Talk. Thanks to Doug Carmichael, I got a copy of The Knowledge, um, How to Reboot Civilization if There's a Massive Fall. And it really strikes me that um, probably no one on this call would know how to actually live off the land if uh, if everything failed, if we had a radical discontinuity and suddenly the supply lines are gone. Um, you know, we we are we are so dependent upon um, this massive system that should it break down, most of us would probably die. Uh, and so Tyson talks about indigenous in in his book. He says, you know, indigenous knowledge is the application of memories of living. Yep. Sorry, am I sorry? Gil, can you mute? Thanks. Um, indigenous knowledge is, is the application of any of the memory of living uh, to improve past, present, or future sustainably on a land base. And I don't think any of us is doing that um, because we're all Northern. Most of us think here, or, well, Hank, you're Northern European, but most of us are North American. We're living inside of a very abstracted, extractive system. And I just went on etymology online and found out that abstraction means withdrawal from worldly affairs. Um, to drag away, detach, pull away, divert. And extraction is the process of withdrawing or obtaining. We live in an extractive and abstracted world that really is not coupled to the land base anymore. Um, so to me, that means we've lost our, our indigeneity. And how do we recover that? Um, how do we, and this goes directly to Janet's earlier presentation around recycling everything that's living sustainably on the planet. So I'm really curious, how can people like us, us here on this call, um, learn to recover being indigenous? What, what's going to re be required in our thinking, in our mindsets, our paradigms, as well as our, and, and the change in behavior that will come from that to live inside of a, uh, uh, a system that's been going on for 4 billion years quite well until we came along and started to mess things up. End of rant. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, Mark, do you have license to interrupt at any moment? Should you want to respond to any of these kinds of things? I won't like just jump in. And otherwise, I will just manage the queue and, and go through the people who'd like to, to talk about this stuff. Thank you, Jerry. I, I certainly um, understand you know, the where Ken's coming from. And, and I go back to the notion of history. If I had wisdom from my great, great, great grandfather, then I would have this continuity of my ancestors in a way that I, I'm, I'm, you know, the way that, you know, our history developed, you know, print has taken over from oral history i don't have that oral history tradition that comes from being in one place for a long time i was born in new jersey new jersey wisdom in the 1960s early 1960s is not going to help me um but I, I certainly empathize and and you know hear the question that ken raises i would love to hear you know comments on that. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much. Um, I will point out that uh, one of the famous trackers, I think uh, Kevin knows him, Tom Scott or something, um, his early uh, le learnings and lessons were in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. And uh, a lot of what he does is is totally connected to the earth. And it's funny because my, my notions of New Jersey shifted when I read his book. Um, pardon? Oh. Hey, Steph. Uh, Kevin, we have noise. I'm gonna no, <clears throat> I've got there we go. It's fun being host. Um, Pete. Uh, Mark, thank you for the the provocation. Um, and I wish we had longer to talk about the the whole the whole topic. Um, because I think I, I the, the provocation makes a space which uh, uh, which is very rich and interesting, but kind of also excludes a, you know, kind of the positive benefit of whatever we might call indigenous wisdom. 
And um, I, the, the thing that I wanted to contribute kind of was that uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience with indigenous wi wisdom, um, but I have some secondhand uh, listening to people like Ken or uh, Wendy Elford, or um, I forget the guy's name who spent a lot of time uh, in South America. Um, but one of the one of the kind of the gleanings I've got from listening to secondhand uh, to those people is that part of indigenous wisdom is just um, uh, con con context contextualization. Uh, so um, uh, Western people, Euro European uh, 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 colonist energy is uh, I'm going to storm in and ter terraform this place so that it's like uh england you know wherever i came from um uh and a lot of indigenous indigenous wisdom is just hey dude you know we've been living here for ten thousand years we kind of know how the, the the thing works why don't you like work with the thing how it works rather than just flattening the whole thing and and trying to make the best copy of england that you can if we talk about colonialism we'll be here for a while <laughs> Thank you. Point. Great point, Doug. Uh, sorry, Doug B. So <clears throat> there, there's a distinction between wisdom and consciousness, and I think the indigenous that I've crossed paths with um, don't speak from wisdom. They, they advocate for a consciousness. And um, I just put a link in the chat that's uh, um, Kogi's um, sort of expressing that the essence of that. And a colleague of mine is working with an association that um, hosts them when they travel through Europe. And I, I really, I think it's really easy to get lost in knowledge and history and um, conduct and behaviors and um, the actions of uh, ancient cultures um, as historical data and as uh, horrific as behaviors as might have happened, um, has nothing to do with the consciousness, the essential consciousness lesson that uh, the indigenous, present day indigenous tribes share or advocating for um, as voices. And I think the fundamental in it um, is that each individual is responsible for how that consciousness informs how they conduct them, how I behave, what I choose to do and not do, the way I choose to relate and not relate. And, and that sort of present moment where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> and um, it's really easy to get sucked down all these rabbit holes because we have this thing on our shoulders, you know, that has this abstract thinking ability um, that keeps everybody distracted from the moment. And um, somebody published a, shared a graph of North Atlantic ocean temperatures for the last 40 years. And there were all these, there was a range of all of these chartings, annual chartings. And then this year, disconnected from the mass of previous years, the line is up here. And as of this week, like now, uh, almost vertical. <laughs> I, 
and it was breathtaking, like from January to today, um, uh, a one, one degree increase or a half a degree. It was a full half a degree increase in six months. Could you share that when you find it again? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'll, I I'm, have the I'm way. skeptical of anything that dramatic. Yeah, well, yeah, so was I until I saw it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but unless it yeah, is. Ab no, absolutely. I'll, I'll put the Thanks. link in the chat. But um, so I really think it's really indigenous consciousness rather than indigenous wisdom. And with that, I'm complete. Thank you, Doug. I'm going to pause for a second to let that sink in. What I'm interested in is Catholic consciousness as an example. So Meister Eckhart, Hildegard de Bingen, um, um, the current Pope, whom am I to judge? Or actually, who am I to judge? Um, when it comes to the consciousness of LGBT people um, in society, I'm wondering how, you know, being steeped in this um, 3,000, you know, 2,000 year tradition that, you know, came from my parents and, you know, people who come from the Jewish tradition, have a longer tradition, and they have a consciousness as well. And I'm trying to, you know, certainly as a polygot religious person, you know, reading Pema Chodron and reading, um, uh, Oh, Tich Nhat Han, you know, certainly the adaptive consciousness that I get from being able to survey the whole richness of human wisdom. I'm I'm kind of wondering about how how does this segment off one kind of wisdom, calling it indigenous, as opposed to the entire wisdom traditions of humanity. Um that that's a that's a, a a different question that kind of comes back to me as someone not you know someone with an indigenous heritage but i don't have the in, in indigenous wisdom that came from my grandmother who was an orphan indian in 1880 in aguascalientes mexico because she did not get wisdom she got badness from 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 you know the colonial interference um please respond uh, uh doug if if you can because this is this this really interests me how can we take wisdom and apply it in our consciousness in the moment but i'm i'm not you know i don't have that connection with indigenous wisdom i would have to go get it from either you or from books or from you know a a structure that passes down the history Thank you. Doug B, if you'd like to reply, um, please step in. Yeah, I, um, so wisdom is of the mental body. Elementally, it's an air. And consciousness is across all five bodies. So it's earth, water, fire, air, and space. It's, 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 it's multi-sensorial, multi-experiential, dimensional, intrinsic to things that live and to human beings. If I can interrupt you, Doug, it's, it's more a question of how do we get it? So if we know what it is, how do me, how does Ken, how does Doug C or Klaus or Janet or Kate get this consciousness? Thanks. So, yeah, and so um, all I can speak from is my own personal experience um, because it's a, it's a living dynamic thing. It's in verbs, not nouns. So um, probably the big, biggest single factor to shifting my own awareness and consciousness in these ways um, has been about letting go of attachments and letting go of beliefs and letting go of um, everything being centered around knowing, around mental, intellectual, abstract, academic data, 
facts, um, instrumentalities, systems, frameworks, models, all of these intellectual constructions. It is not in saying that, I am not saying, discarding all of that. I am not passing a judgment on all of that. I am not knocking all of that. I'm not negating that there is value or may be a value in application from all of that. But all of that is not everything. And there are whole other domains and there's no way to tune in, sense into, feel into, and shift into a different orientation unless those, those things that, that act as anchors and constraints that take reality and, and, and reduce it to a perspective and a view and an orientation are lifted. And that's not a learning or going after or doing kind of thing. That's a discretion and discernment and opening up to an alternative way of thinking about things, of ways of seeing things that are not informed by all that and controlled and constrained by all of that. I don't know whether that helps, but that's all I got. <laughs> um, um, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I want to get to, to Gil, um, but thank you for answering that. Um, thank you. Go ahead, Ken. Up in real quick before Gil. Um, check out uh, of Water and the Spirit, Maladoma Sume. Um, he was uh, from Burkina Faso, West African medicine man, captured by the Jesuits at age four, taken away from his village, traveled 110 miles through the jungle at age 19 to go back to his village, and they wouldn't let him in because they didn't recognize him. And the elders said, he can't come in. His mind has been tainted by modernity. And they eventually decided to let him in and they initiated him. And it's a harrowing story to read. And that changed his consciousness in a hurry. Try being buried in the earth up to your neck overnight with, you know, I mean, that just, I get, I, 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 something in my body just rebelled like, no, 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 please, no. But he taught, he describes the initiation rites that he went through and some people don't make it. And there's something about, these ancient rites of being told you are part of this vast universe that can wipe you out in a second. You need to be aware of the terror and the wonder. And we have, as our uh, industrialized people, no one is very close to the earth in our culture. And the earth is where all life exists. And if we're not close to the earth, we'll just be wiped away. So to if you wanna change your consciousness, Go do some work with with some medicine people and um, get close to the earth. You will change your consciousness, or the earth will change your consciousness. And you won't have to worry about where to find the wisdom because you'll start to think differently. Um, thank you, uh, Gil. Thanks for your patience, Gil. Then me, my hand keeps automatically going down. I don't understand why. <clears throat> um, I've also got kind of a, a dicey internet connection here, and who knows what's going to happen. But let's go uh, to Gil, and then I'll step in. And oh, by the way, and maladoma means he who makes friends with others. And there's an interesting backstory there as well. Makes friends with the stranger enemy. Wow. Mm. 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 Yeah. Oh. Mark, thank you so much for bringing us this topic. Um, you know, you said before, if we started to talk about colonialism, we'd be here for a long time. I think this is a topic that invites a long time. Um, you know, I, 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 I hope we return to this and give it, uh, give it the space. I find that already just in this last, what, 30 minutes, uh, my mood has shifted. My breathing has shifted. My feeling in my body has shifted. I sense the mood in the room as different than certainly the first half of the call and then many of our calls. And there's something uh, very inviting there that I hope we can return to. Um, yeah, Ken touched on one of the things I wanted to say is that, um, and Klaus, you mentioned this last week, when, when you and I were born in 1949, the world was had 2.4 2 billion humans in it. And we're now north of eight. It's like, you know, more than triple, more than 50% urban. Uh, most of us never touch the ground. 
or walk on the ground or lie on the ground or be buried in the earth. Uh, so there's this disconnect from life process that's part of the story. Um, um, and um, I wonder about the boundaries of indigenous. I love the quote from Yunka Porta. Um, but, you know, he comes from a lineage that has had some kind of continuous culture for what, perhaps 20, 30,000 years. Um, other people who we call indigenous, it might be measured in thousands of years. Um, um, some people who we call indigenous are relative newcomers to their place, having displaced other people who are native to this place, not to put any negativity on that, but there's been transitions in human cultures and locations and places. So it strikes me that it's not only a matter of what is it, retaining memories of a life lived sustainably on a land base as part of that land base. But that last phrase strikes me as really important as part of that land base, as belonging to a place, belonging to the living world, belonging to each other, belonging to a community, having a very different sense of self and identity in relation to that community. Um, and um, I've had only one I've had only one experience working somewhat closely with indigenous folks in a, in a client situation. And I'll talk about it more another time if people are interested, but it was, it was remarkable. There was something that I had never experienced before in the listening and the communication and the expectations there. Um, so um, there's something that's, despite all the stresses of modernity and capitalism, and colonialism, extraction and so forth, there's something that is that 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 continues to carry forward. Um, how do we get it? I don't know. You know, we're not going to get most of us buried in the earth up to our necks for a day. Um, but I know that for me, it's been um, partly about listening, learning, learn, learning, trying to learn to listen differently, to listen at a different speed, to listen for different nuance. Um, it's partly a matter of, of making a declaration to, to attempt to explore what it might be like to belong to the living world instead of to belong to whatever it was I thought I was belonging to my whole life uh, or in addition to that. And, and, and so listen and declare and to inquire, to just kind of ask different questions. Uh, to ask not the ne the questions of knowledge and facts and data, but of context and relationship, um, and again belonging. Um, and just one resource I'd offer to people: uh, Gregory Bateson, whose work some of you know, was probably one of the strongest voices in the 20th century about context and and connection and interconnection and relationship of stuff that we tend to carve up into little boxes and separate. Um, and um, um, the Bateson Institute is releasing in September uh, a reissue of Gregory's last book, Sacred Unity, which is a collection of essays. Um, it's available from Triarchy Press, print in September. Ebook e is available now, uh, and it's a it's a, it's a Western British entry into this question that is profound and deep, and I think very complementary to so many. Uh, and the others that we're talking, and, and Younger Port and the others that we're talking about here. Uh, so, Mark, again, thank you so much for raising this. I do hope we come back to this more. Um, thank you, Gil. I'll wait for Gil's um, comments to settle for a second. I certainly come from these questions from a Batesonian perspective, and um, certainly. Uh, Gregory Bateson's daughter, um, Mary Catherine Bateson, who talks against identity politics as opposed to, you know, um, either an exclusive identity where we're the Indians and you can't have any of our knowledge because you're the outsider or we're the you know, Chicanos and you can't join us because we don't want you to eat our carnitas or... But to basically say there's an adaptive multiculturalism that basically says you join with the consciousness of 
I don't belong here. I do belong here at the same time. I don't know what's going on in this Persian wedding ceremony, but I'm going to be adaptive and just kind of go with the flow and just listen for the context and be in the context. I, I suspect that Gregory would um, have a lot of issues with current identity politics because he was always very wary of our modern tendency to categorization and saying this, not that, or this is in this box, or this is in this box, and seeing a much more blurry and intertwingled world. Uh, but he can't speak. Um, and unfortunately, again, Mary Catherine Bateson died about um, three years ago. But, but, really... but Nora Bateson, his other daughter, is carrying exactly. the family business with great richness and depth. Um, they've been doing a series of webinars over the whole year. This has been the, this year, last year was the 50th anniversary of Steps to an Ecology of Mind, which for me was one of the one of the real generative uh, intersections in my life. Uh, and so um, International Bateson Institute, I think some of the recordings are posted. They're very, oh, very yeah. uh, and big. And Nora's notion of warm data is something I think Jerry has mentioned before. And I think, um, you know, if somebody wants to champion that or, or invite Nora, that would be amazing. Um, I just would like to say that, um, uh, thank you, Gil. Um, go ahead, Jerry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. And a couple things. Uh, one, I was going to take a pause also. Thank you for doing that. I think I'll do that also. Uh, two, uh, I'm going to do facilitator's prerogative. I love this conversation. Why don't we pick this up next week so that we can all relax for a moment and think, gosh, I'm going to miss this conversation. We barely turned the soil. Uh, yes, totally agree. Um, and then I'm going to riff for a second and we're getting close to the half hour. I'm wondering, Ken, if you have found a poem, if you'd like to read it now, and then I'll step in and then we'll go as, as long as we want to, to kind of, uh, uh, finish the cue that we've got now, but I, I've got a few things I want to put in the conversation, but I think I'll let me pause and go into silence and can you bring us out with a poem and then I'll step back in and then we'll go to Carl and Klaus. Sound good? Cool. Proclamation. Whereas the world is a house on fire, whereas the nations are filled with shouting, whereas hope seems small, sometimes a single bird on a wire left by migration behind, whereas kindness is seldom in the news and peace is an abstraction while war is real. Whereas words are all I have, whereas my life is short, whereas I am afraid, whereas I am free, despite all fire and anger and fear, be it therefore resolved, a song shall be my calling. A song not yet made shall be my vocation. In peaceful words, the work of my remaining days. Thank you, Ken. If you or Pete would put a link to the poem. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Mark and Pete both found it. And Stafford is fabulous. Oddly enough, the first uh, proclamation poem I received was one with Indigenous wisdom in it, a different poem. That wow. would be the first link. Love about that. the Black Mountains. You want to read it? Sure. Hook Sun is a story. Tucson is a linguistic alternative. The story in the many languages still heard in this place of Black Mountains. They are in the echo of lost, forgotten languages, heard here even before the people arrived. The true story of this place recalls people walking deserts all their lives and continuing today, if only in their dreams. The true story is ringing in their footsteps in a place so quiet they can hear their blood moving through their veins. 
Their stories give shape to the mountains encircling this place. Wa'ak is the story of water memories of this desert. And um, it's it's a bit longer than that, but that's how it starts. Hmm. Um, if you'd like me to finish it, it's about four more stanzas. Hmm. But I think um, in terms of time, that was an introduction. And we can go to Jerry. You had your hand up as well. But uh, yeah, thanks. you can organize. I'm thinking best. maybe we um, we might just open the next call with that as the full reading and take us in that way. That that would be good. That'll give us time then. Um, so I have to be here next Thursday. Ah, can you? I can. Uh, I excellent. Can. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was I was kind of forcing that issue, wasn't I? Um, so I want to put a little bit of stream of consciousness into the call, partly by way of tying together some of the threads that have come up. And every time somebody says something or puts something in the chat, I'm like, oh, crap, right, that fits over here and, and so forth. So so um, um, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I think a piece of what you're saying is, are we idealizing indigenous peoples? Are we like, we, we should all just stop thinking so Western and go do what the indigenous people did. And you're like, well, shit, they were busy doing human sacrifice. They were doing all this violent crap. Uh, what is up with that? Uh, why are we maybe overvaluing it? Or is it really that important? Or uh, haven't Western religions and Western cultures also invented a whole bunch of great stuff? I think that your some of your, your thinking is in that zone. Am I am I sort of am I close with the dart? <clears throat> Unmuting. I was about to put in the meeting chat the other as savior. AI will save us. Um Oh, we hadn't even broached that wall yet. Yeah, Jesus will save us. Um, you know, um, Kevin Kelly and techno futurism will save us. Um, uh, the the Indians will save us. The UFOs will save us. Um, we, I, I hope that. Um, uh, where did he go? Um, I don't see uh, Doug. Doug B. He had to drop off. He just. Okay. Uh, you'll see in the chat that he says au revoir. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, consciousness will save us. You know, I've, I've, I've been raised in Orange County in the 80s with the New Age movement and, you know, the, you know, greed is good as well. I was in the same place. Tammy, you know, Tammy Baker and um, basically, you know, their, you know, televangelism will save us. Trump will save us. Um, it's, it's a disease of the mind um although the third patriarch of zen says the disease of the mind is setting what i like against what i don't like um i don't like the savior stuff <laughs> all right uh, thanks well, at least tammy faye was at least tammy faye was crying real tears there we go yeah you can tell um, by the mascara dripping <laughs> exactly exactly kind of like giuliani's sweat but still <clears throat> somehow those two things are attached in my head um, so I, I, let me sort of look at the little notes that I took in, and put in the chat. One of the things that I think happens is that cultures aren't homogenous over time. They shift, they morph. And sometimes I see some cultures that have really great seed ideas that then get sort of taken over. It's like it's like somebody eats their brain and suddenly they're very different cultures. And, and in my own amateur theory of history, I kind of attribute that to sort of yin versus yang, male versus female. And I see very often that when, when matriarchal societies are taken over and become patrilineal or uh, other, other kinds of societies dominated by men, what we often get is violence, fighting over a chokehold over the culture uh, and other sorts of things. And I'm probably uh, idealizing myself by saying that, but I uh, there's a really interesting uh, uh, paper that I've mentioned a couple of times here, which is like uh, matriarchy is not the opposite of patriarchy. It is about egalitarianism and a bunch of other stuff. And I think I think men's fear is that, oh my God, we can't possibly flip the matriarchy because if they do to us what we've been doing to them, we are well and truly fucked. <clears throat> and nobody wants that. And it's like they have no understanding of any other way to run the world, but they know how crappy the top-down uh, sort of a patriarchal thing has been in different ways. And so, so they're fighting it. Um, so 
so th there's this notion for me that that cultures shift over time, and sometimes the thing that the that the, uh, an interesting culture did later on was really crappy, and so we color it with the really crappy stuff. And I think that things like human sacrifice and all that are are, are sort of part of that. Um, and it could be the human sacrifice goes right back to the roots. I don't know, um, but but I think it's it's interesting that that we like like Taoism. I know only a little bit about Taoism, but I know that the notion of yin and yang is really useful to me, and I borrow it now and then to sort of explain things in my head and to other people. But I know also that Taoism got incredibly ornate and ritualistic. And if you really are Taoist today and you're trying to do, fulfill the thing, you will never make it through all the prayers and rituals and things you have to do as a good Taoist. And it's like, that is just cruft and crust as far as I can tell. I don't know that those things really help anybody. So I'm I'm trying to figure out, uh, I own fubarism.com. What would you do if you could invent your own religion? Um, and I'm like, how do we do a syncretist religion where we borrow belief systems that work and sort of bring them together into a new set of rituals and initiations? And and we mentioned a little bit about initiations and, and that's how to get this indigenous wisdom thing. And it's like initiation rituals have been wiped out in most of our cultures, in particular in Western culture. We destroyed all the ways that older people were bringing younger people into the world and telling them, okay, good, you are now an adult and come on in. And, and there are still bar and bat mitzvahs and there are still quinceañeras, which are actually sort of weddings to, to Jesus. I'm not so sure I like that. Um, but 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 we've lost the, the the you know older people have forgotten their responsibility to bring young people up into the world. That's a problem. Sort of layers onto the other problems. Then we talked only briefly about colonialism, but it's an incredible irony to me that the two growth markets for evangelism and Catholicism in the world are Latin America and Africa, the two places that were absolutely transformed and I would say destroyed and reshaped by the colonial era. That that. It, it kills me when I run into deeply, devoutly Catholic Latin Americans, and I grew up in Latin America, I speak fluent Spanish, who are more devout than anybody else I know, and disconnected from whatever roots I thought I, was, I loved from the cultures that they come from, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that kind of like, I don't get that. It, it pains me to see that. And I have, my, my, I have too much suspicion about Catholicism and what it did and, what, and how it works. That's a different conversation. I will... If I can, yes. Um, trying to make this short. I was uh, interested in a young woman at a party, and um, this she sounds was, like a good story, even as you start. So go ahead. She was blowing me off. And, oh, damn it! Um, yeah, and so you know, I she, I was kind of like, well, what are you into? And and she goes, um, you know, I'm, I'm really religious, and I so so I have the key words. Tell me about your faith. And so she turns on and starts talking about it and how, you know, Catholicism is this really great thing and how, you know, she's really into Santeria. You can't use that black candle magic inside the house. So you have like a, a Weber grill and you light the black candle and you do your ritual in the house and you move it into the backyard so that black candle energy doesn't, you know, mess up the, the wow. house. So I was like going, you know, more than I asked for, but how Catholicism is basically voodoo. Um, and, you know, has been adapted into, you know, the Mayan, um, yeah, Catholicism is, is and Judaism is, is adaptable to, you know, a lot of different contexts. Anyway, short story, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll try to finish my little trail here because we're running over our, our time. Uh, and Carol, I'll try to give you a last word. <clears throat> um, so we haven't really mentioned intergenerational trauma, but I think that's what happens here is that, that there's a lot of bad shit that's gone down in the world. <clears throat> remix mix and remix all the stories that we've been telling and that we know about and oh my god there's a bunch of people who have legit beefs for stuff that happened to their ancestors from other people who are whose whose descendants are still alive and that creates all sorts of friction but that is a delightful thing to actually fan those are flames you can fan and turn into identity wars and identity culture and, and one of my questions here is like hey wait a minute who gets to be indigenous don't we all have indigenous culture in the sense of we all go back to some group, some tribe, some place? Don't Europeans have like roots in some, and there are a lot of early European groups and tribes that were very, very different from what we perceive today that got stamped out really effectively because other people came into power and went about stamping out the Albigensians and, you know, whoever, the, the first, one of the first crusades is the Albigensian crusade. Uh, just 
they, they were not terrible people, but they were declared heretics because what they were saying ran against uh, the Catholic Church. Um, so there's a whole bunch of that stuff that kind of happens there. But I'm wondering, like, the fact of, and I may be misappropriating or misunderstanding indigeneity here, but what if we're all sort of indigenous and can find out and respect our various indigenous roots and figure out how to live together and recognizing those things and finding our way, initiating ourselves into being human together on the little fragile marble instead of being of a tribe or of a thing. And I don't mean here to wipe out long distance or long-term cultures, because I think those cultures are really important. It's just that some of them include things like female genital mutilation that are, that are I think, um, twists on the culture that don't. The way Molly Melching has been reducing FGM in West Africa is by going to the imams in, in towns and saying, hey, this stuff isn't in the Quran, don't you see? And then they're like, oh, you're right. And then that, that village will shift. That village will stop doing FGM, and it, it's a huge, huge change because it's a terrible practice. So stuff like that just happens in history, and I'm puzzled about where did it come up, why do we do it? Um, uh, men seem to fear women, and I think FGM is a really good way to take it out on women and make sure that women aren't like don't keep their power in some sense. It's very weird. Um, and then um, this sort of notion of belonging, I think, is essential, and the identity culture, identity wars, identity politics are. A way of saying, I belong, you don't belong, you're my tribe, you're not my tribe. And we're, and uh, the far right worldwide is fight is, is, is flame is fueling these flames as hard as they can right now. In the meantime, the left in some places is trying hard to fix shit that's broken with kind of old school systems and large scale change. And some of it's working, some of it's not. And we're all ignoring the thing that Doug uh, Carmichael has been trying to get us to talk about more often, which is like, damn, we're destroying the marble that we're standing on. We should kind of unify ourselves to get there. So, so I get that you regret that when you look over at the people that you're from, you see violence. I think there probably is a lot of wisdom there, and uh, you know the the four agreements is a, an interesting book, and there's there's a lot of interesting stuff there. But but I think part of what we need is discernment together as a community and as individuals in community to figure out what are the good parts and what are the bad parts, and how do we fuse together the good parts into something that's highly functional to build a good society together. And that's kind of that's kind of the quest that I think I'm on is, is like, what is that? And, and I don't know enough. It's way above my pay grade to solve, but I love the people that are in these places having these conversations together because I feel like we're making wee little bits of progress, pecking that problem to pieces. Thank you, Jerry. I just would like to point out that discernment together is known as politics. No. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, my God. That is so opposite for me. All right. Because yeah, yeah. Because politics is manipulation. Hmm. That's an interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, that's my take. And a sure. whole other topic, and we're at 940 almost. Exactly. Carl, Carl, please go. Yeah, Carl, off to you. Yeah, there's um yeah, three. Well, there's a whole thing about um perennial wisdom is something I've seen that talks about seeking that, you know, what's that common um wisdom traditions and things. Um there's a um, gospel according to Jesus, Stephen Mitchell, who's an um, uh, ancient language scholar and the Dead Sea Scrolls and stuff that Thomas Jefferson actually took the all the copies of the Bible he had and he literally was cutting and pasting out the passages that he considered truly attributable to Jesus of Nazareth and stuff. And that's the beginning of that book. Um, the other thing is a uh, uh, um, friend of mine from Fielding, uh, Steve, Steve Hassan, he wrote the book, uh, The Cult of Trump, and he's been, he's, his PhD was a bite model, and if you do a search, he, his, he's um, published his dissertation and is in the public domain. Then I, I posted a link to uh, interview from that on being site that gets into the trauma and the, um, how it spans generations. And I think that's a core part of trying to get to um, being in that kind of space that Doug Breitbart was talking about. And then the last thing, I was seeing something about with all this fMRI 
stuff. I mean, it's so biased towards the Western culture. I mean, it's like, oh, this part of the brain lights up when we're angry. Well, people who like from the Koji or these other things who says that they're angry or they're angry when that part of their brain lights up. So, I mean, we need a whole, I mean, I think that's well, in a whole area that needs to get explored more. Mm. Carl, thank you. Uh, Mark, you have the last word and then we will wrap this call and reconvene next Thursday to continue the conversation. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Carl. Um, I did post the perennial philosophy um, a link from Wikipedia. Um, certainly that, and Aldous Huxley's book, you know, there there is, you know, and, and so many books back there are like, you know, wisdom of ancient man, something like that. Um, does it make me wise? Not all the time. I'd like to say hi to Kate. Hi, Kate. And uh, um, her uh, Aunt Janet. Hi, Aunt Janet. And uh, we haven't heard from uh, Michael or, or Hank um, or, or Scott, except in the, um, except in the uh, meeting but chat. And as, you know, side, what is it? Side um, facilitator. I just like to point out those things that um, maybe next time um, we'll hear from uh, um, people who, like we haven't heard from Kate, um, people who don't always speak. Um, but thank you all. Um, thank you, Kate, for giving me a call and telling me, get your ass over here. <laughs> yes, thank you. That worked really well, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I had to throw on a shirt, but um, uh, I didn't have to throw on a shirt, but it was, how do you say, part of the perennial philosophy that you don't show up in Zoom meetings without a shirt. A couple uh, of people missed that message early in the pandemic, but it's sort of sorted out now. Yeah. Um, anyway, good to see you, Michael. Um, it was great seeing you in San Francisco about a month or two ago. Um, and uh, boy, would I would wish we could have spent more time together. Um, thank you all. Um, and uh, yeah, um, this was a surprise to me and also a surprise to, uh, I think, a lot of us as like, huh, we're kind of thinking about this. And this thinking together kind of worked differently from our usual thinking alone or presenting alone, kind of. I'm, I'm, you know, every once in a while, I joke that, you know, I come here and somebody gets on a soapbox and says, this is my soapbox. Okay, next soapbox. Okay, I'm on a soapbox. Okay, next soapbox. And, you know, I'm, I'm over, how do you say, um, uh, I'm oversimplifying that because that's not exactly what goes on here. People do listen. Um, and I really think that, you know, the notion about listening differently, listening slower at a different speed, um, you know, the big question is how to go to the people who have, you know, in the you know, stepwise models of consciousness, some kind of quote unquote lower consciousness, but basically it's a different consciousness and say, we'd really like you to participate in a way that wasn't unkind, that wasn't putting someone else as the other as blameworthy or the other as something that can be, you know, the other's not the savior, but the other's also not the demon as well. And um, again, I don't think any of us have the answer, but I think all of us would like to find how to ask that question in a way that people can figure it out for themselves. Hey, the Democrats really don't hate us. They don't eat babies and they don't you know, do all these things that, that um, are manipulative. Thanks, Trey. Mark, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. And um, until next week. Bye, y'all. Bye,